We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audio book presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audio book with friends and loved ones. This is for educational purposes only. Chapter 6 Attack and Fear The relationship of anger to attack is obvious, but the inevitable association of anger and fear is not always so clear. Anger always involves projection of separation, which must ultimately be accepted as entirely one's own responsibility. Anger cannot occur unless you believe that you have been attacked, that your attack was justified, and that you are in no way responsible. Given these three wholly irrational premises, the equally irrational conclusion that a brother is worthy of attack rather than of love follows. What can be expected from insane premises except an insane conclusion? The way to undo an insane conclusion is to consider the sanity of the premises on which it rests. You cannot be attacked, attack has no justification, and you are responsible for what you believe. You have been asked to take me as your model for learning since an extreme example is a particularly helpful learning device. Everyone teaches, and teaches all the time. This is a responsibility which he inevitably assumes the moment he accepts any premise at all, and no one can organize his life without any thought system. Once he has developed a thought system of any kind, he lives by it and teaches it. You have been chosen to teach the atonement precisely because you have been extreme examples of allegiance to your thought systems, and therefore have developed the capacity for allegiance. It has indeed been misplaced, but it is a form of faith, which you yourselves have been willing to redirect. You cannot doubt the strength of your devotion, when you consider how faithfully you have observed it. It was quite evident that you had already developed the ability to follow a better model if you could accept it. The message of the crucifixion. For teaching purposes, let us consider the crucifixion again. We have not dwelt on it before, because of its fearful connotations. The only emphasis we laid upon it was that it was not a form of punishment. Nothing, however, can be really explained in negative terms only. There is a positive interpretation of the crucifixion which is wholly devoid of fear and therefore wholly benign in what it teaches, if it is properly understood. The crucifixion is nothing more than an extreme example. Its value, like the value of any teaching device, lies solely in the kind of learning it facilitates. It can be, and has been, misunderstood. This is only because the fearful are apartment to perceive fearfully. I have already told you that you can always call on me to share my decision and thus make it stronger. I also told you that the crucifixion was the last foolish journey that the sonship need take, and that it should mean release from fear to anyone who understands it. While we emphasized only the resurrection before, the purpose of the crucifixion and how it actually led to the resurrection was not clarified at that time. Nevertheless, it has a definite contribution to make to your own lives, and if you will consider it without fear. It will help you understand your own role as teachers. You have reacted for years as if you were being crucified. This is a marked tendency of the separated ones, who always refuse to consider what they have done to themselves. Projection means anger, anger fosters assault, and assault promotes fear. The real meaning of the crucifixion lies in the apparent intensity of the assault of some of the sons of God upon another. This, of course, is impossible and must be fully understood as an impossibility. In fact, unless it is fully understood as only that, I cannot serve as a real model for learning. Assault can ultimately be made only on the body. There is little doubt that one body can assault another, and can even destroy it. Yet if destruction itself is impossible, then anything that is destructible cannot be real. Therefore, its destruction does not justify anger. To the extent to which you believe that it does, you must be accepting false premises and teaching them to others. The message which the crucifixion was intended to teach was that it is not necessary to perceive any form of assault in persecution because you cannot be persecuted. If you respond with anger you must be equating yourself with the destructible and are therefore regarding yourself insanely. I have made it perfectly clear that I am like you and you are like me, but our fundamental equality can be demonstrated only through joint decision. 
you are free to perceive yourselves as persecuted if you choose. You might remember, however, when you do choose to react that way, that I was persecuted as the world judges, and did not share this evaluation for myself. And because I did not share it I did not strengthen it. I therefore offered a different interpretation of attack, and one which I do want to share with you. If you will believe it, you will help me to teach it. We have said before, as you teach so shall you learn. If you react as if you are persecuted, you are teaching persecution. This is not a lesson which the sons of God should want to teach if they are to realize their own salvation. Rather teach you own perfect immunity, which is the truth in you, and know that it cannot be assailed. Do not protect it yourselves, or you have believed that it is assailable. You are not asked to be crucified, which was part of my own teaching contribution. You are merely asked to follow my example in the face of much less extreme temptations to misperceive, and not to accept them falsely as justifications for anger. There can be no justification for the unjustifiable. Do not believe there is, and do not teach that there is. Remember always that what you believe, you will teach. Believe with me, and we will become equal as teachers. Your resurrection is your reawakening. I am the model for rebirth, but rebirth itself is merely the dawning on your minds of what is already in them. God placed it there himself, and so it is true forever. I believed in it, and therefore made it forever true for me. Help me to teach it to our brothers in the name of the kingdom of God, but first believe that it is true for you, or you will teach a miss. My brothers slept during the so-called agony in the garden but I could not be angry with them because I had learned I could not be abandoned. Peter swore he would never deny me, but he did so three times. He did offer to defend me with the sword, which I naturally refused, not being at all in need of bodily protection. I am sorry when my brothers do not share my decision to hear only one voice, because it weakens them as teachers and as learners. Yet I know that they cannot really betray themselves or me and that it is still on them that I must build my church. There is no choice in this because only you can be the foundation of God's church. A church is where an altar is, and the presence of the altar is what makes it a church. Any church which does not inspire love has a hidden altar which is not serving the purpose for which God intended it. I must found his church on you because you who accept me as a model are literally my disciples. Disciples are followers but if the model they follow has chosen to save them pain in all respects, they are probably unwise not to follow him. I elected, both for your sake and mine, to demonstrate that the most outrageous assault, as judged by the ego, did not matter. As the world judges these things, but not as God knows them, I was betrayed, abandoned, beaten, torn, and finally killed. It was perfectly clear that this was only because of the projection of others because I had not harmed anyone and had healed many. We are still equal as learners, even though we need not have equal experiences. The Holy Spirit is glad when you can learn enough from mine to be reawakened by them. That was their only purpose, and that is the only way in which I can be perceived as the way, the truth and the light. When you hear only one voice you are never called on to sacrifice. On the contrary, by enabling yourselves to hear the Holy Spirit in others, you can learn from their experiences, and gain from them without experiencing them yourselves. That is because the Holy Spirit is one, and anyone who listens is inevitably led to demonstrate his way for all. You are not persecuted, nor was I. You are not asked to repeat my experiences because the Holy Spirit, whom we share, makes this unnecessary to use my experiences constructively, however, you must still follow my example in how to perceive them. My brothers and yours are constantly engaged in justifying the unjustifiable. My one lesson, which I must teach as I learned, is that no perception which is out of accord with the judgment of the Holy Spirit can be justified. I undertook to show this was true in a very extreme case merely because it would serve as a good teaching aid to those whose temptations to give in to anger and assault would not be so extreme. I will, with God, 
that none of his sons should suffer. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the communication link between God the Father and his separated sons. If you will listen to his voice, you will know that you cannot either hurt or be hurt, and that many need your blessing to help them hear this for themselves. When you perceive only this need in them, and do not respond to any other, you will have learned of me, and will be as eager to share your learning as I am. The crucifixion cannot be shared because it is the symbol of projection, but the resurrection is the symbol of sharing because the reawakening of every son of God is necessary to enable the sonship to know its wholeness. Only this is knowledge. The message of the crucifixion is perfectly clear, teach only love, for that is what you are. If you interpret the crucifixion in any other way, you are using it as a weapon for assault rather than as the call for peace for which it was intended. The apostles often misunderstood it, and always for the same reason that makes anyone misunderstand anything. Their own imperfect love made them vulnerable to projection, and out of their own fear they spoke of the wrath of God as his retaliatory weapon. Nor could they speak of the crucifixion entirely without anger because their own sense of guilt had made them angry. There are two glaring examples of upside down thinking in the New Testament, whose whole gospel is only the message of love. These are not like the several slips into impatience which I made. I had learned the atonement prayer, which I also came to teach, too well to engage in upside down thinking myself. If the apostles had not felt guilty they never could have quoted me as saying, I come not to bring peace but a sword. This is clearly the exact opposite of everything I taught. Nor could they have described my reactions to Judas as they did if they had really understood me. They would have realized I could not have said, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Unless I believed in betrayal. The whole message of the crucifixion was simply that I did not. The punishment which I am said to have called forth upon Judas was a similar reversal. Judas was my brother and a son of God as much a part of the sonship as myself. Was it likely that I would condemn him when I was ready to demonstrate that condemnation is impossible? I am very grateful to the apostles for their teaching and fully aware of the extent of their devotion to me. Nevertheless, as you read their teachings, remember that I told them myself that there was much they would understand later because they were not wholly ready to follow me at the time. I emphasize this only because I do not want you to allow any fear to enter into the thought system toward which I am guiding you. I do not call for martyrs, but for teachers. No one is punished for sins, and the sons of God are not sinners. Any concept of punishment involves the projection of blame, and reinforces the idea that blame is justified. The behavior that results is a lesson in blame, just as all behavior teaches the beliefs which motivate it. The crucifixion was a complex of behaviors arising out of clearly opposed thought systems. As such, it was the perfect symbol of conflict between the ego and the Son of God. The conflict is just as real now, and its lessons, too, have equal reality when they are learned. I do not need gratitude any more than I needed protection but you need to develop your weakened ability to be grateful, or you cannot appreciate God. He does not need your appreciation, but you do. You cannot love what you do not appreciate, and fear makes appreciation impossible. Whenever you are afraid of what you are you do not appreciate it, and will therefore reject it. As a result, you will teach rejection. The power of the sons of God is operating all the time because they were created as creators. Their influence on each other is without limit, and must be used for their joint salvation. Each one must learn to teach that all forms of rejection are utterly meaningless. The separation is the notion of rejection. As long as you teach this, you still believe it. This is not as God thinks, and you must think as he thinks if you are to know him again. The uses of projection Any split in will must involve a rejection of part of it and this is the belief in separation. The wholeness of God, which is his peace, cannot be appreciated except by a whole mind, which recognizes the wholeness of God's creation, and by this recognition, know its creator. Exclusion and separation are synonymous, as are separation and dissociation. We have said before that the separation was and is dissociation, and also that, once it had occurred, 
projection became its main defense, or the device that keeps it going. The reason, however, may not be as clear as you think. In the ego's use of projection, to which we are obviously referring, what you project you disown, and therefore do not believe is yours. You are excluding yourself by the very statement you are making that you are different from the one on whom you project. Since you have also judged against what you project, you continue to attack it because you have already attacked it by projecting it. By doing this unconsciously, you try to keep the fact that you must have attacked yourself first out of awareness, and thus imagine that you have made yourself safe. Projection will always hurt you. It reinforces your belief in your own split mind, and its only purpose is to keep the separation going. It is solely a device of the ego to make you feel different from your brothers, and separated from them. The ego justifies this on the wholly spurious grounds that it makes you seem better than they are, thus obscuring your equality with them still further. Projection and attack are inevitably related because projection is always a means of justifying attack. Anger without projection is impossible. The ego uses projection only to distort your perception both of yourself and your brothers. The process begins by excluding something that exists in you which you do not want, and leads directly to excluding you from your brothers. We have learned, however, that there is another use of projection. Every ability of the ego has a better counterpart because its abilities are directed by the mind, which has a better voice. The Holy Spirit as well as the ego utilizes projection. But since their goals are opposed, so is the result. The Holy Spirit begins by perceiving you as perfect. Knowing this perfection is shared, he recognizes it in others, thus strengthening it in both. Instead of anger this arouses love for both because it establishes inclusion. Perceiving equality, the Holy Spirit perceives equal needs. This invites atonement automatically because atonement is the one need which, in this world, is universal. To perceive yourself this way is the only way in which you can find happiness in the world. That is because it is the acknowledgement that you are not in this world, for the world is unhappy. How else can you find joy in a joyless place except by realizing that you are not there? You cannot be anywhere that God did not put you, and God created you as part of Him. That is both where you are and what you are. It is completely unalterable. It is total inclusion. You cannot change it now or ever. It is forever true. It is not a belief, but a fact. Anything that God created is as true as He is. Its truth lies only in its perfect inclusion in Him who alone is perfect. To deny this in any way is to deny yourself and Him, since it is impossible to accept one without the other. The perfect equality of the Holy Spirit's perception is the counterpart of the perfect equality of God's knowing. The ego's perception has no counterpart in God, but the Holy Spirit remains the bridge between perception and knowledge. By enabling you to use perception in a way that parallels knowledge, you will ultimately meet it and know it. The ego would prefer to believe that this meeting is impossible, yet it is your perception which the Holy Spirit guides. You might remember that the human eye perceives parallel lines as if they meet in the distance, which is the same as in the future, if time and space are one dimension. Your perception will end where it began. Everything meets in God because everything was created by Him and in Him. God created His sons by extending His thought and retaining the extensions of His thought in His mind. All His thoughts are thus perfectly united within themselves and with each other because they are neither partially nor in part. The Holy Spirit enables you to perceive this wholeness now. You can no more pray for yourselves alone than you can find joy for yourself alone. Prayer is the restatement of inclusion, directed by the Holy Spirit under the laws of God. God created you to create. You cannot extend His kingdom until you know of its wholeness. Thoughts begin in the mind of the thinker, from which they reach outward. This is as true of God's thinking as it is of yours. Because your minds are split, you can also perceive as well as think. Yet perception cannot escape from the basic laws of mind. You perceive from your mind and extend your perceptions outward. Although perception of any kind is unnecessary, you made it, and the Holy Spirit can therefore use it well. He can inspire perception and lead it toward God by making it parallel there.
way of thinking, and thus guarantee their ultimate meeting. This convergence seems to be far in the future only because your mind is not in perfect alignment with the idea, and therefore does not want it now. The Holy Spirit uses time, but does not believe in it. Coming from God he uses everything for good, but he does not believe in what is not true. Since the Holy Spirit is in your minds, your minds must also be able to believe only what is true. The Holy Spirit can speak only for this, because he speaks for God. He tells you to return your whole mind to God because it has never left him. If it has never left him you need only perceive it as it is to be returned. The full awareness of the atonement, then, is the recognition that the separation never occurred. The ego cannot prevail against this because it is an explicit statement that the ego never occurred. The ego can accept the idea that return is necessary because it can so easily make the idea seem so difficult. Yet the Holy Spirit tells you that even return is unnecessary because what never happened cannot, cause, any problem. It does not follow, however, that you cannot make the idea of return necessary and difficult. It is surely clear, however, that the perfect need nothing, and cannot experience perfection as a difficult accomplishment because that is what they are. This is the way in which you must perceive God's creations bringing all of your perceptions into the one parallel line which the Holy Spirit sees. This line is the direct line of communication with God, and lets your mind converge with His. There is no conflict anywhere in this perception because it means that all perception is guided by the Holy Spirit, whose mind is fixed on God. Only the Holy Spirit can resolve conflict because only the Holy Spirit is conflict-free. He perceives only what is true in your mind and extends outward only to what is true in other minds. The difference between the ego's use of projection and projection as the Holy Spirit uses it is very simple. The ego projects to exclude, and therefore to deceive. The Holy Spirit projects by recognizing himself in every mind, and thus perceives them as one. Nothing conflicts in this perception because what the Holy Spirit perceives is the same. Wherever he looks he sees himself, and because he is united, he offers the whole kingdom always. This is the one message God gave to him, and for which he must speak because that is what he is. The peace of God lies in that message, and so the peace of God lies in you. The great peace of the kingdom shines in your mind forever, but it must shine outward to make you aware of it. The Holy Spirit was given you with perfect impartiality, and only by perceiving him impartially can you perceive him at all. The ego is legion but the Holy Spirit is one. No darkness abides anywhere in the kingdom, but your part is only to allow no darkness to abide in your own mind. This alignment with light is unlimited because it is in alignment with the light of the world. Each of us is the light of the world, and by joining our minds in this light, we proclaim the kingdom of God together and as one. The relinquishment of attack. We have used many words as synonymous which are not ordinarily regarded as the same. We began with having and being, and more recently have used others. Hearing and being are examples, to which we can also add teaching and being, learning and being, and, above all, projecting and being. This is because, as we have said before, every idea begins in the mind of the thinker and extends outward. Therefore, what extends from the mind is still in it, and from what it extends it knows itself. That is its natural talent. The word knows is correct here, even though the ego does not know, and is not concerned with being at all. The Holy Spirit still holds knowledge safe through his impartial perception. By attacking nothing, he presents no barrier at all to the communication of God. Thus, being is never threatened. Your godlike mind can never be defiled. The ego never was and never will be part of it, but through the ego you can hear and teach and learn what is not true. From this, which you have made, you have taught yourselves to believe that you are not what you are. You cannot teach what you have not learned, and what you teach you strengthen in yourselves because you are sharing it. Every lesson you teach, you are learning. That is why you must teach only one lesson. If you are to be conflict free yourselves, you must learn only from the Holy Spirit, and teach only by Him. You are only love. But when you denied this you made what you are something you must learn. 
We said before that the message of the crucifixion was, teach only love, for that is what you are. This is the one lesson which is perfectly unified because it is the only lesson which is one. Only by teaching it can you learn it. As you teach so will you learn. If that is true, and it is true indeed, you must never forget that what you teach is teaching you. What you project you believe. The only real safety lies in projecting only the Holy Spirit, because as you see his gentleness in others, your own mind perceives itself as totally harmless. Once it can accept this fully, it does not see the need to protect itself. The protection of God then dawns upon it, assuring it that it is perfectly safe forever. The perfectly safe are wholly benign. They bless because they know they are blessed. Without anxiety the mind is wholly kind, and because it projects beneficence, it is beneficent. Safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. No compromise is possible in this. Teach attack in any form, and you have learned it and it will hurt you. Yet your learning is not immortal, and you can unlearn it by not teaching it. Since you cannot not teach, your salvation lies in teaching the exact opposite of everything the ego believes. This is how you will learn the truth that will set you free, and keep you so as others learn it of you. The only way to have peace is to teach peace. By learning it through projection, it becomes a part of what you know because you cannot teach what you have dissociated. Only thus can you win back the knowledge that you threw away. An idea which you share you must have. It awakens in you through the conviction of teaching. Remember that if teaching is being and learning is being, teaching is learning. Everything you teach you are learning. Teach only love, and learn that love is yours, and you are love. The only answer. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the answer, not the question. The ego always speaks first because it is capricious, and does not mean its maker well. That is because it believes, and correctly, that its maker may withdraw his support from it at any moment. If it meant you well it would be glad, as the Holy Spirit will be glad when he has brought you home and you no longer need his guidance. The ego does not regard itself as part of you. Herein lies its primary perceptual error, the foundation of its whole thought system. When God created you, he made you part of him. That is why attack within the kingdom is impossible. You made the ego without love, and so it does not love you. You could not remain within the kingdom without love, and since the kingdom is love, you believe that you are without it. This enables the ego to regard itself as separate and outside its maker, thus speaking for the part of your mind that believes you are separate and outside the mind of God. The ego, then, raised the first question that was ever asked, but one which it can never answer. That question, what are you? Was the beginning of doubt. The ego has never answered any question since, although it has raised a great many. The most inventive activities of the ego have never done more than obscure the question because you have the answer, and the ego is afraid of you. You cannot understand the conflict until you fully understand one basic fact that the ego does not know. The Holy Spirit does not speak first, but always answers. Everyone has called upon him for help at one time or another and in one way or another and has been answered. Since the Holy Spirit answers truly, he answers for all time which means that everyone has the answer now. The ego cannot hear the Holy Spirit, but it does believe that part of the same mind that made it is against it. It interprets this as a justification for attacking its maker. It believes that the best defense is attack, and wants you to believe it. Unless you do believe it you will not side with it, and the ego feels badly in need of allies, though not of brothers. Perceiving something alien to itself in your mind. The ego turns to the body, not the mind, as its ally because the body is not part of you. This makes the body the ego's friend. It is an alliance frankly based on separation. If you side with this alliance you will be afraid, because you are siding with an alliance of fear. The ego and the body conspire against your minds, and because the ego realizes that its enemy can end them both merely by knowing they are not part of him, they join in the attack together. This is perhaps the strangest perception of all, if you consider what it really involves. The ego, which is not real, attempts to persuade the mind, which is real, that the mind is its own learning device, 
and that the learning device is more real than it is. No one in his right mind could possibly believe this, and no one in his right mind does believe it. Here, then, the one answer of the Holy Spirit to all the questions which the ego raises. You are a child of God, a priceless part of his kingdom, which he created as part of him. Nothing else exists and only this is real. You have chosen a sleep in which you have had bad dreams, but the sleep is not real, and God calls you to awake. There will be nothing left of your dream when you hear him because you will be awake. Your dreams have contained many of the ego's symbols, and they have confused you. Yet that was only because you were asleep and did not know. When you awake you will see the truth around you and in you, and you will no longer believe in dreams because they will have no reality for you. Yet the kingdom and all that you have created the will have great reality for you because they are beautiful and true. In the kingdom, where you are and what you are is perfectly certain. There is no doubt that because the first question was never asked. Having finally been wholly answered, it has never been. Being alone lives in the kingdom where everything lives in God without question. The time that was spent on questioning in the dream has given way to creation and to its eternity. You are as certain as God because you are as true as he is, but what was once quite certain in your minds has become only the ability for certainty. The introduction of abilities into being was the beginning of uncertainty because abilities are potentials, not accomplishments. Your abilities are totally useless in the presence of God's accomplishments, and also of yours. Accomplishments are results which have been achieved. When they are perfect, abilities are meaningless. It is curious that the perfect must now be perfected. In fact, it is impossible. You must remember, however, that when you put yourselves in an impossible situation, you believe that the impossible was possible. Abilities must be developed or you cannot use them. This is not true of anything that God created, but it is the kindest solution possible to what you have made. In an impossible situation you can develop your abilities to the point where they can get you out of it. You have a guide to how to develop them, but you have no commander except yourself. This leaves you in charge of the kingdom, with both a guide to find it and a means to keep it. You have a model to follow who will strengthen your command and never detract from it in any way. You therefore retain a central place in your perceived enslavement, a fact which itself demonstrates that you are not enslaved, you are in an impossible situation only because you thought it was possible to be in one. You would be in an impossible situation if God showed you your perfection and proved to you that you were wrong. This would demonstrate that the perfect were inadequate to bring themselves to the awareness of their perfection and thus side with the belief that those who have everything need help and are therefore helpless. This the kind of reasoning which the ego engages in, but God, who knows that his creations are perfect, does not insult them. This would be as impossible as the ego's notion that it has insulted him. That is why the Holy Spirit never commands. To command is to assume inequality, which the Holy Spirit demonstrates does not exist. Fidelity to premises is a law of mind and everything God created is faithful to his laws. Fidelity to other laws is also possible, however, not because the laws are true, but because you made them. What would be gained if God proved to you that you have thought insanely? Can God lose his own certainty? We have frequently stated that what you teach you are. Would you have God teach you that you have sinned? If he confronted the self you made with the truth he created for you, what could you be but afraid? You would doubt your sanity, which is the one thing in which you can find the sanity he gave you. God does not teach. To teach is to imply a lack which God knows is not there. God is not conflicted. Teaching aims at change, but God created only the changeless. The separation was not a loss of perfection, but a failure in communication. A harsh and strident form of communication arose as the ego's voice. It could not shatter the peace of God but it could shatter yours. God did not blot it out, because to eradicate it would be to attack it. Being questioned, he did not question. He merely gave the answer. His answer is your teacher. To have, give all to all. Like any good teacher, the Holy Spirit does no more than you do now, but he teaches only to make you equal with him. This is because you had already taught wrongly, having believed what was not true. 
you did not believe in your own perfection. Could God teach you that you had made a split mind, when he knows your mind only as whole? What God does know is that his communication channels are not open to him, so that he cannot impart his joy, and know that his children are wholly joyous. This is an ongoing process, not in time, but in eternity. God's extending outward, though not his completeness, is blocked when the sonship does not communicate with him as one. So he thought, my children sleep, and must be awakened. How can you wake children better and more kindly than by a gentle voice that will not frighten them, but will merely remind them that the night is over and the light has come? You do not inform them that the nightmares which frightened them so badly were not real because children believe in magic. You merely reassure them that they are safe now. Then you train them to recognize the difference between sleeping and waking, so that they will understand they need not be afraid of dreams. Then, when bad dreams come, they will call on the light themselves to dispel them. A wise teacher teaches through approach, not avoidance. He does not emphasize what you must avoid to escape from harm so much as what you need to learn to have joy. This is true even of the world's teachers. Consider the confusion a child would experience if he were told, do not do this because it might hurt you and make you unsafe, but if you do that you will escape from harm and be safe, and then you will not be afraid. All of this could be included in only three words, do only that. This simple statement is perfectly clear, easily understood, and very easily remembered. The Holy Spirit never itemizes errors because he does not frighten children, and those who lack wisdom are children. Yet he always answers their call, and his dependability makes them more certain. Children do confuse fantasy and reality, and they are frightened because they do not know the difference. The Holy Spirit makes no distinction among dreams. He merely shines them away. His light is always the call to awake, whatever you have been dreaming. Nothing lasting lies in dreams, and the Holy Spirit, shining with the light from God himself, speaks only for what lasts forever. When your body and your ego and your dreams are gone, you will know that you will last forever. Many think this is accomplished through death. But nothing is accomplished through death because death is nothing. Everything is accomplished through life, and life is of the mind and in the mind. The body neither leaves nor dies because it cannot contain you to a life. If we share the same mind, you can overcome death because I did. Death is an attempt to resolve conflict by not willing at all. Like any other impossible solution which the ego attempts, it will not work. God did not make the body because it is destructible, and therefore not of the kingdom. The body is the symbol of what you think you are. It is clearly a separation device, and therefore does not exist. The Holy Spirit, as always, takes what you have made and translates it into a learning device for you. Again as always, he reinterprets what the ego uses as an argument for separation into a demonstration against it. If the mind can heal the body but the body cannot heal the mind, then the mind must be stronger. Every miracle demonstrates this. We have said that the Holy Spirit is the motivation for miracles. This is because he always tells you that only the mind is real since only the mind can be shared. The body is separate, and therefore cannot be part of you. To be of one mind is meaningful, but to be of one body is meaningless. By the laws of mind, then, the body is meaningless. To the Holy Spirit there is no order of difficulty in miracles. This is familiar enough to you by now, but it has not yet become believable. Therefore, you do not understand it and cannot use it. We have too much to accomplish on behalf of the kingdom to let this crucial concept slip away. It is a real foundation stone of the thought system I teach and want you to teach. You cannot perform miracles without believing it because it is a belief in perfect equality. Only one equal gift can be offered to the equal sons of God and that is full appreciation. Nothing more and nothing less. Without a range an order of difficulty is meaningless, and there must be no range in what you offer to each other. The Holy Spirit, who leads to God, translates communication into being, just as he ultimately translates perception into knowledge. The ego uses the body for attack, for pleasure, 
and for pride. The insanity of this perception makes it a fearful one indeed. The Holy Spirit sees the body only as a means of communication, and because communicating is sharing, it becomes communion. You might argue that fear as well as love can be communicated, and therefore can be shared. Yet this is not so real as it sounds. Those who communicate fear are promoting attack and attack always breaks communication, making it impossible. Egos do join together in temporary allegiance, but always for what each one can get separately. The Holy Spirit communicates only what each one can give to all. He never takes anything back because he wants you to keep it. Therefore, his teaching begins with the lesson, to have, give all to all. This is a very preliminary step, and the only one you must take for yourself. It is not even necessary that you complete the step yourself, but it is necessary that you turn in that direction. Having chosen to go that way, you place yourself in charge of the journey, where you and only you must remain. This step appears to exacerbate conflict rather than resolve it because it the beginning step in reversing your perception, and turning it right side up. This conflicts with the upside down perception which you have not yet abandoned, or the change in direction would not have been necessary. Some people remain at this step for a very long time, experiencing very acute conflict. At this point many try to accept the conflict, rather than take the next step towards its resolution. Having taken the first step, however, they will be helped. Once they have chosen what they cannot complete alone, they are no longer alone. To have peace, teach peace to learn it. All the separated ones have a basic fear of retaliation and abandonment. This is because they believe in attack and rejection, so this is what they perceive and teach and learn. These insane concepts are clearly the result of their own dissociation and projection. What you teach, you are, but it is quite apparent that you can teach wrongly, and therefore teach yourselves wrong. Many thought that I was attacking them, even though it was quite apparent that I was not. An insane learner learns strange lessons. What you must understand is that, when you do not share a thought system, you are weakening it. Those who believe in it therefore perceive this as an attack on them. This is because everyone identifies himself with his thought system, and every thought system centers on what you believe you are. If the center of the thought system is true, only truth extends from it. But if a lie is at its center, only deception proceeds from it. All good teachers realize that only fundamental change will last, but they do not begin at that level. Strengthening motivation for change is their first and foremost goal. It is also their last and final one. Increasing motivation for change in the learner is all that a teacher need do to guarantee change. This is because a change in motivation is a change of mind, and this will inevitably produce fundamental change because the mind is fundamental. The first step in the reversal or undoing process, then, is the undoing of the getting concept. Accordingly. The Holy Spirit's first lesson was to have, give all to all. We said that this is apartment to increase conflict temporarily, and we can clarify this still further now. At this point, the equality of having and being is not yet perceived. Until it is, having appears to be the opposite of being. Therefore, the first lesson seems to contain a contradiction, since it is being learned by a conflicted mind. This means conflicting motivation and so the lesson cannot be learned consistently as yet. Further, the mind of the learner projects its own split, and thus does not perceive consistent minds in others, making him suspicious of their motivation. This is the real reason why, in many respects, the first lesson is the hardest to learn. Still strongly aware of the ego in himself, and responding primarily to the ego in others, he is being taught to react to both as if what he does believe is not true. Upside down as always, the ego perceives the first lesson as insane. In fact, this is its only alternative here, since the other one, which would be much less acceptable to it, would obviously be that it is insane. The ego's judgment, then, is predetermined by what it is, though no more so than is any other product of thought. The fundamental change will still occur with a change of mind in the thinker. Meanwhile, the increasing clarity of the Holy Spirit's voice makes it impossible for the learner not to listen. For a time, then, 
he is receiving conflicting messages, and accepting both. This is the classic double bind in communication. The way out of conflict between two opposing thought systems is clearly to choose one and relinquish the other. If you identify with your thought system, and you cannot escape this, and if you accept two thought systems which are in complete disagreement, peace of mind is impossible. If you teach both, which you will surely do as long as you accept both, you are teaching conflict and learning it. Yet you do want peace, or you would not have called upon the voice for peace to help you. His lesson is not insane, the conflict is, there can be no conflict between sanity and insanity. Only one is true, and therefore only one is real. The ego tries to persuade you that it is up to you to decide which voice is true, but the Holy Spirit teaches you that truth was created by God, and your decision cannot change it. As you begin to realize the quiet power of the Holy Spirit's voice and its perfect consistency, it must dawn on your minds that you are trying to undo a decision which was made irrevocably for you. That is why we suggested before that there was help in reminding yourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to decide for God for you. You are not asked to make insane decisions, although you are free to think you are. It must, however, be insane to believe that it is up to you to decide what God's creations are. The Holy Spirit perceives the conflict exactly as it is. Therefore, his second lesson is, to have peace, teach peace to learn it. This is still a preliminary step, since having and being are still not equated. It is, however, more advanced than the first step, which is really only a thought reversal. The second step is a positive affirmation of what you want. This, then, is a step in the direction out of conflict since it means that alternatives have been considered, and one has been chosen as more desirable. Nevertheless, the evaluation more desirable still implies that the desirable has degrees. Therefore, although this step is essential for the ultimate decision, it is clearly not the final one. It is clear, at this point, that the lack of order of difficulty in miracles has not yet been accepted, because nothing is difficult that is wholly desired. To desire wholly is to create, and creating cannot be difficult if God himself created you as a creator. The second step, then, is still perceptual, although it is a giant step toward the unified perception which parallels God's knowing. As you take this step and hold this direction, you will be pushing toward the center of your thought system, where the fundamental change will occur. You are only beginning this step now but you have started on this way by realizing that only one way is possible. You do not yet realize this consistently and so your progress is intermittent, but the second step is easier than the first because it follows. The very fact that you have accepted that is a demonstration of your growing awareness that the Holy Spirit will lead you on. Be vigilant only for God and His kingdom. For your own salvation you must be critical, since your salvation is critical to the whole sonship. We said before that the Holy Spirit is evaluative, and must be. Yet his evaluation does not extend beyond you, or you would share it. In your mind, and your mind only, he sorts out the true from the false, and teaches you to judge every thought that you allow to enter your mind in the light of what God put there. Whatever is in accord with this light he retains, to strengthen the kingdom in you. What is partly in accord with truth he accepts and purifies. But what is out of accord entirely he rejects by judging against. This is how he keeps the kingdom perfectly consistent and perfectly unified. What you must remember, however, is that what the Holy Spirit rejects, the ego accepts. This is because they are in fundamental disagreement about everything, being in fundamental disagreement about what you are. The ego's beliefs on this crucial issue vary, and that is why it promotes different moods. The Holy Spirit never varies on this point, and so the one mood he engenders is joy. He protects it by rejecting everything that does not foster joy, and so he alone can keep you wholly joyous. The Holy Spirit does not teach your mind to be critical of other minds because he does not want you to teach errors and learn them yourselves. He would hardly be consistent if he allowed you to strengthen what you must learn to avoid. In the mind of the thinker, then, he is judgmental, but only in order to unify the mind so it can perceive without judgment. 
This enables the mind to teach without judgment, and therefore to learn to be without judgment. The undoing is necessary only in your mind, so that you cannot project falsely. God himself has established what you can project with perfect safety. Therefore, the Holy Spirit's third lesson is, be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. This is a major step toward fundamental change. Yet is still a lesson in thought reversal, since it implies that there is something you must be vigilant against. It has advanced far from the first lesson which was primarily a reversal, and also from the second which was essentially the identification of what is more desirable. This step, which follows from the second as the second follows from the first, emphasizes the dichotomy between the desirable and the undesirable. It therefore makes the ultimate choice inevitable. While the first step seems to increase conflict and the second step still entails it to some extent, this one calls for consistent effort against it. We said already that you can be as vigilant against the ego as for it. This lesson teaches not only that you can be, but that you must be. It does not concern itself with order of difficulty, but with clear-cut priority for vigilance. This step is unequivocal in that it teaches there must be no exceptions, although it does not deny that the temptation to make exceptions will occur. Here, then, your consistency is called on despite chaos. Yet chaos and consistency cannot coexist for long, since they are mutually exclusive. As long as you must be vigilant against anything, however, you are not recognizing this mutual exclusiveness, and are holding the belief that you can choose either one. By teaching what to choose, the Holy Spirit will ultimately be able to teach you that you need not choose at all. This will finally liberate your will from choice, and direct it towards creation within the kingdom. Choosing through the Holy Spirit will lead you to the kingdom. You create by what you are, but this is what you must learn. The way to learn it is inherent in the third step, which brings together the lessons implied in the others and goes beyond them towards real integration. If you allow yourselves to have in your minds only what God put there, you are acknowledging your mind as God created it. Therefore, you are accepting it as it is. Since it is whole, you are teaching peace because you believe in it. The final step will still be taken for you by God, but by the third step, the Holy Spirit has prepared you for God. He is getting you ready for the translation of having into being by the very nature of the steps you must take with him. You learn first that having rests on giving, and not on getting. Next you learn that you learn what you teach, and that you want to learn peace. This is the condition for identifying with the kingdom, since it is the condition of the kingdom. You have believed that you are without the kingdom, and have therefore excluded yourself from it in your belief. It is therefore essential to teach you that you must be included, and that the belief that you are not is the only thing that you must exclude. The third step is thus one of protection for your minds, allowing you to identify only with the center, where God placed the altar to himself. We have already said that altars are beliefs, but God and his creations are beyond belief because they are beyond question. The voice for God speaks only for belief beyond question which is the preparation for being without question. As long as belief in God and his kingdom is assailed by any doubts in your minds, his perfect accomplishment is not apparent to you. This is why you must be vigilant on God's behalf. The ego speaks against his creation, and therefore does engender doubt. You cannot go beyond belief until you believe fully. Transfer, which is extension, is a measure of learning because it is its measurable result. This however, does not mean that what it transfers to is measurable. On the contrary, unless it transfers to the whole sonship, which is immeasurable because it was created by the immeasurable, the learning itself must be incomplete. To teach the whole sonship without exception demonstrates that you perceive its wholeness, and have learned that it is one. Now you must be vigilant to hold its oneness in your minds because, if you let doubt enter, you will lose awareness of its wholeness and will be unable to teach it. The wholeness of the kingdom does not depend on your perception, but your awareness of its wholeness does. It is only your awareness which needs protection, since your being cannot be assailed. Yet a real sense of being cannot be yours while you are doubtful of what you are. 
This is why vigilance is essential. Doubts about being must not enter your mind, or you cannot know what you are with certainty. Certainty is of God for you. Vigilance is not necessary for truth, but it is necessary against illusions. Truth is without illusions, and therefore within the kingdom. Everything outside the kingdom is illusion, but you must learn to accept truth because you threw it away. You therefore saw yourself as if you were without it. By making another kingdom which you valued, you did not keep only the kingdom of God in your minds, and thus placed part of your mind outside it. What you have made has thus divided your will, and given you a sick mind which must be healed. Your vigilance against this sickness is the way to heal it. Once your mind is healed, it radiates health and thereby teaches healing. This establishes you as a teacher who teaches like me. Vigilance was required of me as much as of you, but remember that those who will to teach the same thing must be in agreement about what they believe. The third step, then, is a statement of what you want to believe, and entails a willingness to relinquish everything else. I told you that you were just beginning the second step, but I also told you that the third one follows it. The Holy Spirit will enable you to go on, if you follow him. Your vigilance is the sign that you want him to guide you. Vigilance does require effort, but only to teach you that effort itself is unnecessary. You have exerted great effort to preserve what you made because it was not true. Therefore, you must now turn your effort against it. Only this can cancel out the need for effort, and call upon the being which you both have and are. This recognition is wholly without effort since it is already true and needs no protection. It is in the perfect safety of God. Therefore inclusion is total and creation is without limit.